to our honorable guests, uh, honorable and distinguished uh, members of the university, to our elders, the indigenous people, uh, Auntie Ali, and uh, all the custodians of the land. I pass my greetings to all you ladies and gentlemen who are here with us today. Good evening. My grandfather, his experience at home has taught us many lessons. Today I want uh, to share a story with you before I introduce myself. After his release, my grandfather goes on a tour around the country and a tour around uh, the continent as well as uh, to the international sector. During uh, his time in South Africa, he visits a small town outside Bloemfontein. And when he's there, they arrive with the, the National Executive Committee of the ANC, the African National Congress. And uh, at the time, they were mobilizing the masses. He arrives at this function together with other leaders. And uh, before they uh, sit uh, on the podium, he asks to go to uh, the gents' room. And uh, he goes out, he meets uh, one of the nurses at uh, this clinic they were opening. Excuse me, ma'am, where can I find uh, the gents, uh, the toilets, please? Oh, move, you stupid man. We are uh, trying to uh, prepare for most important guests that are coming today. <laughs> and he becomes shocked and he says, no, I'm just looking for a toilet. Please direct me in the right way. And again, this nurse says, I told you we are preparing for important guests. Move along now, move along. So quietly he steps back and he makes his way and finds the toilets, comes back and sits on the podium. Now this nurse comes and sits on the, one of the front tables and they start introducing the guests. Oh, this is Tokyo Sehwale, a member of the ANC who was in Robben Island. This is so-and-so who was in exile uh, in Zambia with the ANC. And now uh, the president uh, of the ANC, Nelson Mandela, and uh, as he stands up, the lady starts shrinking <laughs> and going under the table and disappears. And by the time my grandfather is standing, she just disappeared out of the room. So before I start making people disappear out of the room, I'll take the opportunity to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm Kosi Zuelivelile Mandlesizwe Dalibunga Mandela, the eldest son of Zuelinzima Mahatu Lewanika Mandela. I've always wanted uh, to hail such a man that gave birth to me, who is no longer but very often I tend to be introduced as the eldest grandson of uh, Nelson Kholishasa Talipunga Mandel. So uh, without uh, really taking much time, I want to start uh, reflecting on uh, the 90 years my grandfather has lived and kind of trace a couple of the identities that have been associated with him, his role uh, that he's had over the 90 years. And mainly, I'll start uh, firstly with the traditional aspect where he grew up, moved into the political sphere when he journeyed to Johannesburg, look at uh, his involvement within the ANC Youth League as well as the ANC, and then uh, look at uh, his mobilization uh, of uh, the masses in the 50s, defiance campaign, uh, treason trial, as well as the Rivonia trial. He's uh, leaving the country without uh, a passport to mobilize the African uh, uh, continent as well as the international community. Him coming uh, illegally into the country and uh, uh, being regarded as the Black Pimpernel, government searching for him for two years before he was arrested and joined his comrades for the Rivonia trial and eventually uh, sentenced to life to Robben Island prison years and the impact it had on the family, as well as uh, his release. Uh, prior to his release, uh, the pressure both uh, internally and ex externally from South Africa, 
uh, as well as uh, his release. Uh, then the presidential years, the impact he had on African leaders and uh, the local leaders as a whole. Then uh, how he inspired me as a young man within, uh, growing up within the Mandela's and taking this position of uh, leadership, traditional leadership. So after having introduced the, the agenda for the evening, I'd like us uh, to start with the, the softer touch. My grandfather has been a, a renowned a diplomat, statesman, a, a world icon. But how much do we know of the man? What do we really know of him? So we throw a couple of questions to the room. Who is his mother? Any takers? No ni mampe mvumandel. Who's his eldest son? Matiba Tembegile Mandel. Okay, let's go on an easier one. Who's his grandfather? Mandela is his grandfather. It's whom we all uh, trace ourselves after. But uh, just to uh, share a bit of uh, knowledge and uh, the identities that have led to the people we are. My grandfather is born by Nkosim Paganyi Swakarla Mandela from his third wife, which is Nosegeni uh, Mandela. Uh, Mpaganyi Swa is born uh, by Mandela and uh, his wife being Umagrina. Uh, Umandela is the younger son of King Gubenguga in the left hand house. In the, the senior brother was Magate. In the great hand house, you have Mtikhara and Joy. In the right hand house, you have Mangani. Those are the sons of King Gubenguga of the Tembu nation who ruled in 1790 and died in 1832. His father was Ndaba. Ndaba's father was Zondwa. Zondwa's father was Tato. Tato was born by Matiba. Matiba is who we all call ourselves as. He's a Matiba, I'm a Matiba. An interesting thing is that we're both Mandela's, but Zugo here is Dani, but he's also part of the Matiba clan. And uh, he was a renowned king that was loved by his people. He is the son of Allah. Allah is the son of Rom. Rom was a junior brother to uh, Hlanga, and uh, in a battle for succession, Ulomo attacked his brother and took the kingship. And the kingship was altered within the temples from uh, Hlanga to uh, Lomo. Their older brother is Ndungwan. Those three are the sons of Ngego. Ngego was given birth by Nguti, Nguti by Toi, Toi by Ntande, Ntande by Tretume, Tretume by Pomoi. Bomoyi has an interesting brother known as Mvelase. Mvelase are the temples now that reside in what is known today as KwaZulu Natal, uh, in a place called Kuten. When uh, the rest of the temples journeyed south with Bomoyi, Mvelase remained with uh, their uh, sector of the clan in KwaZulu Natal. It would be one of his descendants known as Ngoza that would finally defeat Shaga. And the only man that has fought Shaga in a battle and defeated him of the Zulu monarchy. Velase and Pomoi are the sons of Tembu. We are known as the Madiba clan to be the Tembu nation after an ancestor that lived. He is the son of Mchanya. Mchanya is the son of Mbulali. Mbulali is the son of the great Malandela. Malandela's brother was Malangazana. It is Malangazana that gives birth to the genealogy of the Kosas. So the Kosas are junior brothers to us, and we are no means a part of the Kosa nation. We are separate as the Tembus, and the Kosas are separate. I don't speak a Kosa language, I speak a Tembu language because I trace my genealogy under Tembu. That's who we are, a history of 
six to eight centuries, it dates back to 11th century, that is the time of Malandela. With that said and done, I'd like anyone in the crowd to trace their family back that far. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hand up. Anyway, <clears throat> to move along then, Madiba, my grandfather, who I better uh, call him Tatom Kulu, which is grandfather. And sometimes when we praise him, we call him Adalpo. Uh, that is his manhood name that was given to him upon when he uh, journeyed on a circumcision journey and became a man. He was born in a remote village of Mvezo on the river banks of Mbashe River. And Mvezo is where his father uh, was chief of. In 1920, the family would uh, uh, have uh, one of the most disastrous blows ever dealt to the family when Nunkosum Paganiswa was uh, removed from his land, losing both his wealth in cattle and his land, and was forcefully relocated to Kunu. The reason of that was that he rejected um, a someone by a white magistrate. In uh, rejecting that someone, he was uh, refusing to identify with the foreign rule in our country, in our territory. He was refusing uh, to subject himself and his people and the, tradi uh, and the Tembu customs to a foreign rule. That led to him being removed in Mveso. My grandfather was only an infant of two years old at the time and they were relocated to Kuno. It was there that my grandfather would learn uh, the traits of being a head boy, grow up most days eating roots while herding uh, his father's cattle, learn how to uh, shoot birds of the sky with his stick. If some of you have taken a closer look at him, he's got a black permanent mark on his left side of the uh, forehead. He was dealt a heavy blow uh, by one of the young men who was a head boy with him at the days. Uh, Kunguluza was his name. He came up to him one day and said, Mandel, let's fight. My grandfather got his sticks and they started fighting. And Kunguluza struck him on the head. He started bleeding. My grandfather, with his uh, stubbornness, continued to fight and uh, dealt a blow, same blow to Kunguluza. Kunguluza started bleeding, looked on the floor. No, Matiba, you've defeated me today. And the case was rested. <laughs> My grandfather's stubbornness has been apparent in his name. His father named him Kholithatha, which is translated as pulling of the, of the branch. But the literal meaning of that name is troublemaker. <laughs> we all know the trouble that he's caused in his times. Uh, he suffered a loss of his father at the age of nine years old. And uh, the chief regent, Chongindaba Mtikaka, took over him and uh, became his custodian to ensure that he looked after him while growing up. The reason for that responsibility uh, Chong Taba showed was that during uh, the debate of succession amongst the Tembus, it would be my grandfather's father, uh, Nkosum Paganiswa, that intervened when Dalinjebo passed on. His successor, Chong Lizwe, was still young to take over. Then there was a debate which, as to which one of his sons should now take over as king within the Tembus. My great-grandfather stood against the whole nation, whereas the nation wanted Dabulamanzi to take over. My great-grandfather said he is a threat to the monarch. He sits on the right-hand house, and the right-hand house, it has been seen often in history when they are acting as uh, kings, the monarch never returns. So my grandf great-grandfather then decided it should be Chong Taba that takes the position and acts on behalf of uh, Uchong Lizu, mainly because he came from a minor house. 
and uh, John Daba, in returning the favor to my great-grandfather, looked after my grandfather. It would be him that would ensure that my grandfather, uh, my grandfather underwent proper schooling. He took him first to a school in Kogolwen, where my grandfather had hard times under the family that he was staying with, the Yakos, and uh, my grandfather would complain, complain to the regent that every time he had to go to school, Mr. Yako used to say, Madiba, come here. You must take out the sheep. And then as you drive the sheep out of the crawl, they all spread different direction. And he would run back to the house to take his school back and try to get to school as early as he can. Then Mr. Yako will call him back. I think we forgot to do a head count. You must now collect all the sheep and bring them back. And that was the task of the whole day because the sheep had gone all over the place. So uh, that was beginning to affect his schooling. And uh, he then uh, was brought back, uh, sent uh, to a school in Kuno, where upon arriving, one of uh, his teacher, uh, Mrs. Mdingi, patted him on the back and said, what's your name, young man? He said, Holy Thatha. And the teacher said, no, from today you are Nelson, go in. And that's how he became Nelson Holithatha Mandel. Uh, it would be in Mkagezweni where my grandfather will gain an understanding of the traditional setting. The tribal men will sit within the bunga and discuss the matters of the community. And the bunga is like a tribal parliament where the community comes and listens to various cases that uh, uh, I challenge to the community. And uh, it would be here that uh, he would uh, learn diplomatic skills of uh, the uh, regent, the senior chiefs and the senior councillors discussing various matters and how to uh, make their debates heard and more clearly. But uh, I think uh, the greatest thing that uh, my grandfather in Kagezweni uh, got to learn was when he underwent initiation. Uh, and uh, in uh, his journey, they come out of initiation as a group of about 38 boys. They are now in their manhood days and uh, he's given the name Dalibung as a man, which means that or the one that will establish the bunga, or the one that will establish parliament. And we know that name is of significance because he became the first black president or the first president of a free democratically led government in South Africa. So it became really a name that would be uh, realized in actuality. Uh, in Mkagezweni, he says that when they came out, he had never been clued up on politics. He had never had a single day where he can recall as today, it's when he became politicized. But there was an incident when they came out, when Chief Melkili stood up suddenly in front of them as young initiates. Today, you come out as men, have lost all your boyish ways, but you are a man without no land, you are a man with no recognition, a man with no identity. You have been forced into homelands, into reserves, and uh, you need to live your life with a purpose. And it was that moment that my grandfather started realizing that he needed to live his life contributing to the struggle of his people. But uh, he went on further to study in Hilltown. He went on from Hilltown to Tlagbari, from Tlagbari uh, to um, Forte. And uh, in Forte, he started engaging in student politics. Uh, student politics would uh, uh, lead him to a strike that uh, he took a position that a certain black teacher that was being um, uh, fired by the institution had been dealt wrong. And uh, the students went on a strike. 
when uh, he was forced by the dean to uh, change his position, he refused and took a stand and was therefore fired from Forte. When he arrived at home to tell the chief regent this, the chief regent thought he was being silly and he needed to go back to school. And again, he uh, made a stand and never went back. The decision of the chief regent was that, well, now that you are circumcised and you are home, you need to take the position of your father and go back and be a tribal chief. Uh, the mistake with that was that the uh, chief uh, regent would uh, then engage in what was tradition, find him a, a, a wife and uh, engage in lobola, which is dowry. But without knowing the woman he had chosen for my grandfather was actually Justice's girlfriend and Justice was the son of the regent. And the two young men then retreated and said, what are we gonna do with this situation? They stole two oxen of the chief, sold them, got some money, and left for Johannesburg. And my grandfather parted with his ways in the rural areas. Uh, it would be then in Johannesburg, as young men, when they arrived, they tried to find accommodation. So he went to the mines, and uh, they started putting a levy on the mine workers there who, when seeing a son of the regent, thought, oh, one of our senior chief is here. So they would collect monies from all the workers to uh, give as a levy to their chief. And Justice felt now that he was a prominent, uh, he was in a prominent position, would go with my grandfather, let's go celebrate. But my grandfather always had the passion to go back to his studies. Therefore, he enrolled at uh, VETS and continued to pursue his uh, law degree. In doing so, he then meets a magnificent man that would become an idol to him, which is the Honorable Walter Sisulu. Walter Sisulu was far ahead of his times and would be able to identify leaders. He was the architect of the ANC and the brain behind the movement. On meeting my grandfather, he suddenly saw qualities of leadership in him, brought him close, assisted him in securing his first house in Orlando, in Orlando West, 8115, a house that would become uh, the center of uh, mobilizing uh, leaders during the 50s. In meeting uh, Walter Sisulu, at Walter Sisulu's house, uh, Ma Sisulu would cook for all kinds of people that came to the house. Uh, Anton Lembede, who became the first president of the ANC Youth League on the 10th of April, 1944. Uh, Ashley Peter Mda, Oliver Tambo, Robert Sobukwe, who left the ANC and formed uh, the Pan-Africanist Congress. Uh, various other leaders would become associated uh, uh, with one another in this small household within Soweto. In forming the ANC Youth League, the young leaders changed the ANC for a greater movement. My grandfather and uh, his associates, uh, led by Anton Lembede, felt the time had come for them to become more aggressive in their tactics and to engage government directly. The ANC-led organization by Dr. Koma felt that the organization was still okay going ahead, being a passive movement and the movement of the elitists. The young warriors of the day who approached Koma and said to him, it's either you with us, you join this new strategy, or we're gonna find a candidate to remove you. And by surprise, Kuma thought, oh, these were uh, young childish leaders, and he refused. In refusing, they went and took a non-significant leader from the South African Communist Party, 
J.S. Muroka supported him fully and won the votes. J.S. Muroka asked uh, Dr. Kuma, and the ANC now engaged in mass mobilization throughout the country. My grandfather would spend most of his time on the road, uh, leaving his family. His first wife, who had married in uh, 1944, Evelyn Masse, uh, Umam Kwati was uh, to give birth to uh, Tembegile as a firstborn, Magaziwe, who died as an infant, Mahatu, who is my father. Also, um, he passed on in 2005. Uh, it would be um, the second Magaziwe in the first marriage. He would later, in 1956, uh, with his commitment to uh, the struggle of his people in ensuring that uh, his people were liberated, uh, the marriage would take on strain and uh, would later uh, divorce Evelyn in 1956. And uh, by 1958, he remarried Winnie Matigizela Mandela and had two daughters with him, Zenani and Zinziswa. During the time of the 50s, my grandfather spent endless hours on the road, mobilizing the people throughout the country, preparing them for the defiance campaign. The apartheid regime had just emerged in 1948, and uh, it would be the words of Oliver Tambo that uh, echoed uh, throughout the years in my grandfather's head that when uh, the National Party came into government, Oliver Tambo said to my grandfather, now we are dealing with reality. We will, in our lifetime, realize our dreams because we are fighting an enemy that stands to eradicate all of us or ensure that we destroy that enemy. So whilst we remain committed to our cause, we will realize our means. And uh, this puzzled my grandfather for <laughs> some time because the apartheid regime introduced uh, injustices laws throughout the country. And uh, the first of them uh, would be uh, the suspension of the Communist uh, Act the Communist Party was banned in, 1950, uh, in 1950. Then the Bantu Education Act, which uh, deprived black people from a good education and rendered them to be inferior to uh, a white uh, population. In mobilizing the people, my grandfather then came up with other leaders uh, to have a joint defiance campaign which, was, uh, uh, which included leaders of the Congress. That would include the Indian, uh, uh, the Indian National Congress. That would include uh, the uh, South African uh, Communist Party, which became unfortunately banned. And uh, at that time, my uh, grandfather and other leaders spent endless uh, uh, time on the road mobilizing the masses and uh, they would go to individuals, uh, young men and women, and say, go and have yourself freely arrested, uh, volunteer to be arrested, let's break all the laws that we can possibly break. So all the laws that were passed on by apartheid, they came out in full force and broke every little law that existed, bent their passes, and uh, volunteered themselves to be arrested. All the prisons throughout the country became very full and uh, the apartheid regime felt pressure. In the midst of that, in 1955, they will draft up one of the most uh, exceptional um, charters that would be taken by uh, the majority of South Africans an idea that was brought up by Z.K. Matthews, which 
became the Freedom Charter, which was drafted on the 25th and the 26th of uh, June in 1955. The Freedom Charter would lay the basics of what the black population was striving for, an opportunity to live in a country together, side by side. It didn't uh, matter what race you were, but you lived as equals. You shared the resources of the land as equal, free education for all, and uh, free health facilities for all. The people shall govern. That's what the primary essence of the Freedom Charter were, laying the principles of the Constitution to come. It was immediately rejected uh, by the apartheid regime and they refused to participate uh, in the Freedom Charter. This uh, would then uh, lead uh, in 1956 to the arresting of 156 leaders that were associated with the drafting of the Freedom Charter and who were believed to have participated in, uh, the, free, uh, in the defiance campaign. That was the beginning of the treason trial. A government that was trying to silence the black population and ensure that they didn't have a voice. Once again, they, they triumphed and uh, they were able uh, to uh, become victorious because of the legal uh, representatives they had, such as Arthur Chuckleston. My grandfather and Oliver Tambo would then feel the need to leave the country. Going to uh, uh, Africa, they landed in Ethiopia, they went to Algeria to mobilize uh, the international sector, as well as went as far as uh, the UK in England and mobilized the international sector to take a stand against the uh, apartheid regime. On his coming back, he would be hunted by government for two years and he became the Black Pimpernel. And uh, he would drive around the country as a chauffeur, uh, I believe to Richard. And uh, eventually he would be uh, arrested. At the same time, some of his comrades were also arrested in what became the infamous uh, Rivonia trial. A Rivonia trial would deal a huge blow to the organization because some of the top leaders, like Walter Sisulu, Raymond Mshaba, Governor Mbegi, Andrew Mlangeni, Ahmed Katrada, were all arrested and uh, sentenced uh, to life to, in Robben Island. Most uh, that uh, were not caught fled the country and went into exile. So from the early 60s, the ANC seemed to be crushed as both the ANC and the uh, Pan-Africanist uh, Congress were banned and uh, they went to set up their structures in exile. My grandfather and them uh, and uh, his comrades would be sent uh, to uh, Robben Island. It would be through these years that a lot of pressure would be exerted on the family Firstly, his mother, uh, Nosegeni, would have to fend for the family in a patriarchal system where men were very dominant. Uh, here, she had to uh, look after the family property and uh, some men uh, within the Mandela house wanted that land for themselves, realizing that the heir was in prison and the possibility of him coming out was nil. Uh, some men of the family also changed their names because they didn't want to be associated with a, a political prisoner. So today in Kono, you have people that change their names from Mandela to Mandela. And uh, we always find it uh, interesting because uh, the very same individuals when my grandfather came out of prison then changed the same names back to Mandela. And uh, we always laugh at them and uh, declare them as traitors within their family. Uh, but uh, you also, uh, at the time, uh, 
with uh, my great grandmother uh, being old, she passed on in 1965. And my grandfather was unable to come home and bury uh, his own mother. In 1969, the young man he had brought up and entrusted to look after the family, Tembegile Matiba Mandela, would also uh, pass on in a fatal uh, car accident. And uh, this dealt a huge blow to the family. The family uh, in the uh, late 60s would then be granted uh, an opportunity to visit uh, my grandfather, and uh, that would be through uh, his wife, uh, Winnie, who had uh, annual visits. And uh, they spoke in Robben Island uh, on the other side of the class without being able to touch. And uh, my uh, grandfather really uh, felt uh, a lot of pain in that time, felt that uh, he couldn't fend for his own children that uh, uh, were uh, exposed to a lot of challenges uh, outside uh, uh, within South Africa. Uh, my own father uh, would uh, later leave for Swaziland to be educated in Swaziland. You find then an interesting uh, change in the South African politics that would become one of the major contributors to one of our successes. A young man emerges in 1969 from a university that I went uh, to in Rhodes University when there was a, con a student conference there. Uh, Steve Biko with other young black uh, men, that, uh, men and women that had attended a student conference there faced the worst discrimination of its kind when they got to Rhodes University to the conference. They couldn't sit in joint uh, hostels or residences with their white counterparts. They were given a church in the township and uh, 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 forced to sleep in that area. It was then that Steve Biko would break ties uh, with uh, UNISAS, uh, which was a, a more liberal institution that represented the student voices. In doing so, they formed what became known as SASO, the South African Student Organization. That movement started conscientizing black people about their uh, situation in the country, their position, and uh, uh, started uh, ensuring that they should dedicate themselves to uh, the cause of uh, social upliftment in their communities. This was a strategy the apartheid regime firstly embraced because they thought it went hand in hand with their Bantu stand pro policy. The Bantu stands were set up as independent states where black people were forced to live in those areas according to their uh, ethnic uh, identities. So if you were closer, they were, uh, were put in uh, Transkai as well as Siskai, the Zulus in Guazulu, the Ndebeles in Guandebele, the Vendas in Guavenda. And we became minorities in that manner because now uh, the uh, apartheid regime was able to quantify us to smaller numbers, whereas united we were a threat, we were uh, the majority. My grandfather over the years in prison uh, would uh, then uh, start learning about the youth that were being mobilized. The black voice started uh, 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 emerging in the townships. And uh, this led to uh, the 1976 uprisings whereby uh, the youth went out on the streets and rejected Africans as a medium of instruction at school. And uh, this uh, led uh, to uh, the apartheid regime breaking down a march, a peaceful march that was of uh, young students around Soweto and uh, opened fire directly to the crowd, killing a young innocent boy, Hector Peterson. Uh, and this uh, 
a manner of aggression on young kids <coughs> grasped the international community. And it would be then the people would learn of the harsh realities in South Africa that were being exerted on the people. This for uh, the ANC and uh, the PAC in exile then gave them an opportunity where a lot of youth were leaving and fleeing the country to go into exile with the belief that they would gain access to arms and come the following month or two to topple the government. But that was not so. The ANC was mobilizing, gaining its strength in exile. My grandfather, with the pouring of uh, young uh, inmates, such as uh, Mafi Murobe, such as Tokyo Sehwale that arrived on Robben Island, they were also very angry, wanting to uh, overtopple uh, the prison wardeners, break free from Robben Island, and uh, go and take over the country. It was here that my grandfather and uh, the elder leaders had to show discipline and uh, turn those youth to be uh, uh, instruments of uh, the uh, struggle. Here, they would politicize the youth. They will guide them into uh, going uh, to uh, engaging in studies. Robben Island became an institution of learning. People subscribed uh, to various degrees and uh, various uh, institutions and would do their studies through Robben Island. It was my grandfather's uh, understanding that when the day came, when they were released, they needed to have professionals that would be able to interpret some of the policies. So he led a young man in uh, Robben Island and uh, ensured that they engaged in higher learning. A fatal incident would become the real platform of the negotiations and a way forward as to achieving a peaceful transition. In the early 80s, my grandfather would uh, f uh, fall ill and have prostate cancer. He was taken to Tigerberg Hospital. And uh, in that uh, pre uh, uh, hospital, government hospital, a certain Kubikutze would come and visit him. He was the Minister of Defense at the time. And Kubikutze says to him, uh, Matiba, how do you and I resolve such complexities in our country. And my grandfather says, well, if you were president and I were president, we would resolve everything here and now in this room. But the unfortunate circumstances of that is that the ANC is in Lusaka and the head of the ANC is Oliver Reginald Tambo. The head of the state here in South Africa is P.W. Porter and not yourself. For any peaceful transition, the government needs to go to Lusaka and engage with the ANC in exile. Uh, it would uh, be there that the apartheid regime would realize the need to start having talks with the ANC. And uh, it was uh, then uh, Kubi Kutze that would uh, secretly have talks with the Africana business community that would then go to uh, Accra to have the first initial talks with the ANC in trying to understand their policies and what change meant to them. That laid the foundation for more talks. While my grandfather was in prison, I would find myself in a very awkward position as a young man in Soweto during June 16, when we were commemorating the spirit of the 1976 youth, we would go around the township banning everything that represented the apartheid regime. All the buses that came into the township, the administration uh, uh, buildings that were in the townships, we bent them down. And suddenly I will hear on the streets, power! Power! Viva Mandela! Viva Mandela! 
And I thought to myself, uh, why are these people uh, echoing our family name? I come back at home and I tell my father, you know, the people were saying, Viva Mandela, Viva ANC. Why do they keep shouting our family name? My father understood that I didn't have the connection. And uh, he asked my aunt uh, Zinzi to take me on a journey of self-discovery. I would leave Soweto with my aunt Zinzi in a, a beetle, and we drove from Soweto to a remote township just outside Bloemfontein called Brantford. And there, when we arrived in the early evening, comes a strange woman all excited. Oh, my children, my children, where's my grandson? And I come out of the car, she gives me sweets and toys, and she's hugging me and kissing me, and I'm like, wow, who's this strange lady? We spent most of uh, the evening uh, talking, and she was very interested on my development. What grade are you in now? Uh, what sport do you like? The following morning, we wake up as early as about four to get to Bloemfontein. We were taking uh, the early morning flight at six o'clock to Cape Town. I flew with my grandmother, Winnie. Arriving in Cape Town, an Indian man comes uh, to greet us. And for me, it was one of the first times I would meet someone different from a, a black uh, person. And Dala Omar comes uh, with his uh, wife, Farida Omar. They transport us to a uh, Paulsmore prison. And uh, I'm amazed at this big building and its size. And we walk in, we uh, sit in the waiting room. Then while we are waiting there, it starts daunting on me that, oh, there are too many bars in this room. Actually, we're in a prison. Then my grandfather walks in. Oh, yes. While he's coming down the uh, corridor, he starts greeting the wardeners. Oh, yes, yes, how are you? And eventually he walks in the room. Oh, Winnie, how are you? And they start uh, greeting and hugging each other. With excitement, uh, he starts uh, asking, how's the family doing? How's so-and-so? How's so-and-so? He asks all the members of the family. And uh, eventually he looks down the room and is like, Oh, that must be Mandla, my grandson. And I'm thinking, yes, and uh, who are you? <laughs> and uh, again, uh, in his humble way, he tries to accommodate me because he sees I'm all isolated in the corner. Oh, I'm your grandfather, uh, the father of your uh, father, Mahatu. Uh, and uh, uh, I was very reserved because then I couldn't understand what my grandfather was doing in prison. A prison for me had been a, a place for people that had done wrong in society, uh, who had engaged in criminal activities. So I remained very shy and very silent. Uh, when we uh, finally got back home, I rushed to my grandfather, uh, to my father and asked, what is Utatom Kulu doing in prison? Is he a criminal? And my father realized that uh, that connection he needed hadn't happened and started uh, conscientizing me as to what my grandfather's role had been, how he dedicated his life to the struggle of his people and uh, committed himself to liberating his people. We would, from time to time, uh, get letters from him I think one of the best gifts I've ever received from him was while he was in prison. He sent me my first pair of soccer boots and uh, would always write in his letters, so how are you doing uh, in soccer? How's schooling? What's your favorite subject? And uh, uh, when I would reply, no, I'm doing very well, and I would uh, enclose uh, my report so that he sees how I'm uh, uh, developing, he would then inquire. So uh, you're a soccer star, eh? I think I must arrange a meeting with you with one of the owners of the big clubs. And I'm thinking, how are you going to do that as a prisoner? <laughs> but uh, he was that kind of a special being, always had an interest on uh, what we were doing as a family. And uh, uh, I remember uh, while I was in uh, uh, the trans guy, 
staying with my grandmother. He felt that uh, staying, uh, staying in a Bantu stand in a homeland reserve will uh, retard my development. And uh, he asked for my mom to go to Tsofimvaba uh, uh, in the trans guy, take me and steal me from there because my parents had separated. You must steal that young man and bring them to the township so that uh, he's exposed to uh, modern issues. In that way, he will be able to develop. And my mother did so. And that is how I came to Johannesburg. And I was enrolled in a school called Holy Cross in Deep Kloof. A, a, a Catholic school. As well in uh, the mid uh, uh, 80s, my grandfather would then ask uh, the uh, youth through a letter he had smuggled from Robben Island and uh, uh, sent uh, to his youngest daughter, Zinziswa. Zinzi would read this letter asking the youth in South Africa to render the country ungovernable. Here, the youth went out as uh, usual in their business of uh, ensuring uh, the country was chaotic. As well, we had uh, pressure from the external uh, borders of South Africa, which were assisting the ANC in its armed struggle. You had the international abroad uh, exerting uh, pressure through sanctions. And uh, uh, South Africa then at the time started feeling the pressure. With the country being ungovernable, the leadership of the apartheid regime had to undergo change. That is how P, uh, F.W. de Klerk emerged ousting his uh, predecessor, uh, P.W. Porter. And uh, the clerk would then put in place reforms that would lead us to a platform or an environment that would ensure that we had uh, free negotiations in the country. The first thing he did was to release the political prisoners so the likes of Walter Sisulu, Govan Mbegi, Raymond Mklaba, Ahmed Katrada, Andrew Mlangeni were released first in 89. And uh, uh, the ANC was unbanned together with the PAC, allowing the people in exile to come back. In February 1990, my grandfather would be released. I was sitting at the time in Swaziland, studying in a boarding school called Waterford Kamklaba, where I was presented with an opportunity to see what a rainbow nation could be. Because Waterford was a United World College, we had uh, Asian students there, we had Europeans, we had Africans, we had uh, uh, people from uh, uh, America that were studying there and we would be able, as a young man, to remove that stigma of hatred towards other races and uh, be understanding of what a future South Africa would be. And when the day came, they were speaking of my grandfather's release. I had just seen him about two months before that, and I thought to myself, this is impossible. He would have mentioned it to us. We are his family. We ought to have known so we can prepare for this day. But I was shocked to see him cross the lines of Victor Vester prison in Pal, walking out as a free man. On that Sunday morning, I lost my mind, left school, hitchhiked to the border gate, crossed the border, hitchhiked in a truck, and I kept explaining to the truck driver, I'm Matiba's grandson. No, get away, man. The Matiba doesn't have boys. He only has two daughters. I said, no, my father is his uh, son. No, no, he's never had a son. <laughs> and we would argue all the way to the outskirts of Johannesburg. He dropped me in uh, Pinoni. And there again, I got a, a hike uh, from a newspaper driver who was working for the Sowetan. He took me uh, to Johannesburg and gave me money for a taxi to go to Soweto. He also couldn't believe that he was sitting with a Mandela in the car. 
Eventually, I would arrive in 8115, my grandfather's house. And uh, when I get to the gate, it's become a new city. International media has poured from all corners of the world. And uh, there's a security guard at the gate. And I come to him, excuse me, please open, please open. Get away, what do you mean I must open? No, this is my home, I stay here. No, 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 no. Too many of you have been taking chances today claiming that you're Matiba's uh, family. Leave, man, we are sick and tired of you. <laughs> so I would become that reserved and start walking back. Fortunately for me, one of our relatives by the name of Mkoma showed up and could see this man chasing me away and he got very upset. You idiot, how can you not know Matiba's family? This is his eldest grandson, the son of Mahatu. So I was then brought in, and for a good three days, I forgot that I was a student at Waterford Gamshaba in Swaziland. I was so happy to be home with my family, with my grandfather, holding us as his grandchildren and his children in his arms as a free man. But again, he would call me, are schools closed? <laughs> no, no, granted, we're not closed. So what are you doing here? I'm here to see you, granted, uh, you are free now. No, 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 you must go back to school at once. So immediately on a, a Wednesday, about three days I had been there, he sent me back to Swaziland with one of the security. And I was very miserable for two years in Swaziland trying to complete my studies. My mind was at home, I just wanted to go back home, I just wanted to get back. But uh, he's been a man that when he's taken a decision, he stands by it and is very passionate about development, about uh, education for his family. So when I finished in 92 in Swaziland, I then went back to uh, Soweto and uh, resided at the infamous 8115. Actually, myself and my brothers with my father were the last to reside at that house in Soweto in 8115 before my grandfather uh, would then move to uh, Johannesburg in a, a, a suburb called Houghton after his divorce with Winnie. He uh, went there, took myself and my brothers to go and stay there with him, insisting on my father to go back to school. And my father at that late age finally gave in to his father went back to school at the age of 40, you know, 39, I think he finished school at the age of 42, gaining his LLP, following in his father's footsteps, and he did law. And uh, it would be then uh, my grandfather uh, would exert a lot of pressure on my father to play the role of the head of the family to ensure that he looked after the family matters. Because my grandfather, had uh, come out of prison, engaged uh, in uh, uh, political activities throughout the country. Some people look at uh, the transitional period to have been a miracle. It's been described as a peaceful transition. For my own uh, studies, from my own understandings, I differ with that in that when my grandfather came out, the first and foremost thing he did was to heal himself first. He had to ensure that in leading the people, he was a healed individual. He came out knowing what the purpose is. And uh, in his spirit of forgiveness, he did one remarkable thing that I'll never forget. By calling the wife of his oppressor, he was sentenced and sent to prison by the likes of Fervut. But when he came out, he would call on the wife of Fervut and say, come, let's have lunch, as if they've been friends for years, you know. And uh, at first, she was very reserved, and, uh, but eventually uh, had lunch uh, with my grandfather. And they became uh, better friends from that. And I would gain the understanding that he was an exceptional individual to be able to sit across the table with people that sentenced him to three decades in prison, but 
had that spirit to forgive. And uh, that was a remarkable thing because now as young black South Africans who had a lot of hatred within us, we then needed to step back and realize what the purpose was. I remember uh, days during the transitional period when the violence was at its peak. The violence itself would be termed black on black violence as if it was something intrinsical to a black identity, to the black race. But then I ask myself often, why wasn't the anglo boer war called white on white violence? You would uh, have terms like, oh, actually, the violence is a, an ethnical or a tribal war between the Corsas and the Zulus. But the actual war or the actual violence emerged in KwaZulu-Natal, where the Zulus were killing one another. So how can that be an ethnical war when it's within one group? And by the time it spilled over to the reef, Various people were murdered in Buipato. Uh, about 38 people were killed in that township. And Buipato is a Sotswana area. So how was it a tribal war between Zulus and Corsas? We came on an understanding that there was the third force participating behind uh, these uh, uh, killings. My grandfather again uh, took on the responsibility of apologizing for the violence uh, of uh, the transitional period during the TRC, taking responsibility as the ANC and uh, for their participation. But uh, once again, leaders such as Mangosutu Butelezi of the IFP and uh, F.W. de Klerk of the National Party never took responsibility for their actions. What really became the turning point and something that laid the foundation for negotiations was the assassination of Krisani on the 10th of April. His assassination silenced the country, forced the youth to take up arms, he was someone that led the ANC in, in exile, led the armed struggle, very much loved by the youth. I remember when the news came, we were at home. My grandfather was in Kunu. I had gone to uh, Kofimvaba to visit my grandmother. And suddenly, uh, the security uh, uh, team at home arrived and said, hey, Mandla, your grandfather wants you to come home. We're going back to Johannesburg. And for the first time, we sat in a plane with my grandfather the entire journey to Johannesburg, almost a two-hour flight, very quiet, silent. And uh, in arriving in Johannesburg, the whole leadership of the ANC was at home and they were debating. The young leaders uh, were wanting a war, wanting to strike back, and the veterans needed a moment to think. And my grandfather and his comrades, like Walter Sisulu, sat back and uh, said, no, we need not blow this out of proportion and take our victory, take our freedom when we've achieved it and reduce it to a bloodbath going into civil war. Let's maximize on the incidents of the day. And right there and then, Walter Sisulu will come up with the idea, let's pressure the government into elections. And my grandfather made that call. And when you want to see him now attacking an individual, going to battle, you would see the anger in him and his tone of voice. He picked up that phone and spoke in a manner that was demeaning to the state president. Boy, we want elections immediately. And he put the phone down. Never gave him a chance to say anything. 
but it would be in a, a later days that the clerk would realize that if he didn't announce the date of elections, then he would force himself to be accountable for the civil war that would follow. And he made the announcement of elections to be in April 1994, and the rest is history. We know on that year, on the 27th of April, people stood in queues for miles waiting to cast their votes for the first time. And we became a free, democratically led government by the ANC. We come to the issue of miracle, peaceful, I've said peaceful transition. The identities associated with the violence, black on black violence, ethnical tribal war, also, it was depicted as a political war between the ANC and the IFP. The apartheid regime or the National Party government removed itself from taking responsibility from any sense of the violence, putting the blame on the two other political parties as if the, the country could not be governed by a black-led government. And. Uh, we came to an election that would see us through this. My grandfather would play an important role in ensuring that we have an identity as a society, that of nation building, that of reconciliation, because we were a nation that had been exposed to extreme oppression. Injustices had been dealt to our people. And that laid the platform for the Truth and Reconciliation Committee to engage in findings as to what needed to be done to heal the nation. It has been applauded as one of the successful achievements by the South Africans, the TRC. But uh, some of us still feel that the duration they looked at was uh, very uh, uh, small in the sense that from it was uh, 1960 to 1990. And uh, its findings as well have been contested by a number of people. If you look at uh, uh, the issue that uh, the victims of apartheid and its perpetuators, first of all, to gain amnesty, it was said you needed to speak out as a perpetuator and you needed to have political attachment. Uh, that political attachment then meant someone needed to take responsibility, either the ANC or the National Party or the IFP. So people were granted amnesty. The victims as well were said to receive a retribution. But how do you quantify such injustices to an amount? I could not today say for my grandfather's 20 years in prison, the Mandela's deserve to be given a million or 10 million because you cannot quantify that injustices that South Africans underwent and experienced. I think uh, I've touched on a lot of issues that have been the highlight of his 90 years. And uh, I'd like to briefly touch on uh, how he inspired me as a young man to find myself in such a position of leadership and being a traditional leader in our community. You know, uh, my grandfather has always been uh, persistent, uh, ensuring that he looks after the development of his family. He's taken me uh, through my education. And when I finished my uh, uh, high school, I did uh, uh, two diplomas one uh, in marketing and uh, uh, business management, the other one in management 
uh, with uh, the South African Institute of Management. And I really thought uh, I had achieved what I needed to achieve. I went into the business community, started working. And uh, it was in uh, the early 2002 that he started exerting pressure on me. You know, Mandla, you need to build a strong foundation. I want you to go back to school. And to me, this was like a joke, you know. I left school in 95 and uh, I've been uh, working and I'm in the business sector. And he keeps insisting and calling me for lunch. Uh, let's have lunch. You need to go back to school. And I'm like, no, granted, can you stop now? Um, and uh, it would uh, uh, be his humble way uh, as a grandfather to say, as the head of the family and as your grandfather, I would like you to go back to school you know, and build a strong foundation. That took me back and uh, I had to reflect as to the man has insight. He knows uh, a lot of things. He's been to uh, many experiences. I then decided to go back to Rhodes and uh, pursue a political uh, a science degree of which I finished. Um, and when I graduated, or before then, during my studies, we would then uh, uh, have yet another fatal blow in the family. My father became ill and passed on. He was HIV positive at the time. And uh, my grandfather really uh, was drawn back, having lost his second son. And uh, at that intense moment during those stress times, the family would uh, be in a debate as to what do we do. And my grandfather said we needed to speak out. We needed to come out and inform the public because he felt that there was a huge stigma associated with HIV AIDS that we needed to break. So he then turns to me, Mandla, what do you think? And I say, granted, I fully support that. You know, we have people in our rural areas that lock up their children or their grandchildren who are HIV positive and don't want them to be exposed to the public. And we need to destroy the stigma associated with HIV AIDS. We eventually came out and spoke out about my father's passing. My grandfather went further to establish the 46664 uh, campaign to build awareness around HIV AIDS. At my father's funeral, I would also disclose that uh, my stepmother, my father's second wife, Zondi, had also passed on H being HIV positive. And uh, we've continued as a family to be advocates uh, throughout our communities to ensure that we better the lives of our people and educate. I live in a community with no electricity, with no access to clean water, with no health facilities, with uh, uh, basic uh, health, uh, with basic uh, education institutions, only a primary school that we have we don't have a high school, therefore our kids always leave when they finish grade six. And uh, they go to um, Tata, which is 85 kilometers away, or they go to East London, which is about 250 kilometers away to further their studies. So there continues to be a brain drain in our rural communities. And uh, the challenges are rife. Our people are still living in extreme poverty and uh, I often thank such opportunities to come out with uh, organizations such as Ma Africa Tikkun to be able to raise awareness about conditions. Our children, especially in South Africa, living in disadvantaged communities such as townships and rural areas, that the work that my grandfather and his associates like Walter Sisulu, uh, Oliver Tambo, Govan Mbegi, Ahmed Katrada, Andrew Mlangeni, dedicated most of their lives to ensuring that we better the lives of our people. And I think we need to continue on those footsteps, ensuring that we are dedicated to that and not, that, and not only servicing to enrich the few 
that want to claim the struggle for themselves. It was about the masses. My grandfather's uh, struggle or his fight for liberation was dedicated to the people at the grassroots level. I thank you.